Welcome to the Big Unlock Podcast, your leading source of info for insights and best practices in digital health and digital transformation. Join host Patty Padmanabhan, CEO of Demo Consulting and co-author of Healthcare Digital Transformation, how technology, consumerism, and pandemic are accelerating the future in conversation with leading practitioners of healthcare and technology. This podcast is sponsored by HealthNext, the enterprise class virtual care platform from Tech Mahindra Health and Life Sciences. Hello again, and welcome back to my podcast. This is Patty, and it is my great privilege and honor to introduce my special guest today, Craig Richard Will, Chief Information and Digital Officer for SCL Health. Craig, thank you so much for setting aside the time and welcome to the show. Thank you, Patty. I appreciate the opportunity. You're most welcome. So Craig, let's start with this. Maybe you can tell us a little bit about SCL and the patient populations that you serve. Yeah, SCL is actually a merger of two healthcare systems. One is the Sisters of Charity of Leavenworth, which is based out of Leavenworth, Kansas. And the other one was Exempla Health based out of Denver, Colorado. And thus, SCL uh, is headquartered in Broomfield, Colorado. It's about a $3 billion Catholic faith-based organization just north of Denver. We serve three primary markets. One is the front range market, which is the greater Denver area, east of the Rockies. One is Western Colorado. So that's on the other side of the Rocky Mountains, more toward Utah. And the last is the state of Montana. We still have several assets in Kansas. Those are more uh, safe haven type of facilities, but the three primary markets are Front Range, Western Colorado, and the state of Montana. Thank you. That's great uh, background for our listeners. So let's talk a little bit about your role, Craig. So you're Chief Information Officer and Chief Digital Officer for SCL. Maybe you can tell us how that title came about and... uh, And then also tell us a little bit about some of your major digital programs that you're currently operating at SCL. Yeah, well, I arrived at SCL Health in February of last year, so of 2019. And at that time, we had some digital activities, but we really didn't have a digital executive. So what I did is I went through a restructuring process, evaluating the leadership team that I had, spoke with a lot of my colleagues, primarily uh, the chief marketing officer, And we put together and developed a vice president of digital services. And we put that position within the IT department. And so as part of that maturity, we also then combined the assets of both marketing and IT that both had heavy hands and put those into the one team. And then both the chief marketing officer and myself sit on the executive sponsors of that program, our digital health program. And so the way that the title kind of came about was by merging those together, we really created a new organization. So we call it ITDS, so it's information technology. So it really respects a lot of the history of what it really came up through information services or IT, but we also added digital services. So ITDS, which is kind of our foundation for our new levels of engagement and what the future will look like. Some of the projects that we put the program together have to do with Really, I would say kind of several different themes. One is the digital front door. And really the digital front door is a way for us to not only more heavily engage with our patients, but also open up that engagement and that access uh, to our consumers. We also have a digital workforce component. So we're using things like RPA and chatbots to automate the services that we provide. And we also are looking with Salesforce and the health cloud to be an area to get a 360 view of our patients. So when we do have engagement with our patients or with our consumers, we have many aspects of the relationships that they have both within healthcare and specifically within SEL Health. That's quite a comprehensive uh, a mandate as far as digital goes, especially from the point of view of transforming your patient experiences. Do you consider any of your IT transformation initiatives at the back end, things like uh, cloud migrations, things like data analytics, do you consider any of them to be part of your digital program? Yeah, actually they all do support. So I actually have 10 programs that we actually kicked off. Digital is one, technology is another, for example. 
Google, one of our partners, is another. And what we've done is we've actually put those programs together so they do have a unique set of uh, responsibilities and projects that are led by those programs, but they all are interrelated. So we have one within our technology that's called the SCL Cloud that will leverage a lot of the Google Cloud platform, sometimes called GCP. And it'll also look at the other cloud services and our data center transformation as all being a component of that. So the digital assets that we're producing and sending out to both internal customers and external all have a more modern foundation on the back end. Now, digital itself is a term that has multiple definitions across the healthcare ecosystem. You already gave us a really good comprehensive overview of what you're doing from a patient facing and a digital front door standpoint. Do you define digital primarily in terms of patient experience transformation? And when you talk about digital front doors, maybe you can give us a little bit, maybe double click a little and tell us about one or two things that define the way you're transforming your patient experience using digital front door as an example. Okay, great. Yeah, digital health for us, you know, the way that we're defining that is really, it's all aspects of our operation. So one that you mentioned is certainly the patient. It's a big aspect of how we're focusing a lot of those resources and those investments on that patient experience and engagement, but also on the consumer side. So those that are not yet patients, how do we get them into our ecosystem and to be able to deliver services back to them? We also look at it and we have a stream of work that's headed toward our providers. So we're looking at things toward like conversational AI, other types of automation that actually will help the providers be more efficient and effective in their work. Artificial intelligence for us fits within that digital aspect for the provider piece. And also for our internal customers, for example, our employees, our associates, and or those contractors that do work within our healthcare system. How can we continue to evolve that relationship and continue to progress the engagement in a more effective and efficient manner. When you look at the digital front door, basically we're using that as a, a place to have the external patients or potential patients slash consumers enter into our uh, environment. So with that comes easy access, make it very efficient, start to move things to be more towards self-service things that we've seen in other industries like in finance and in retail, where a lot of the historical clerical type work, commodity kind of work kind of gets moved back into the customer's hands because he or she actually can do it better and be efficient at it and can do it at any time that they prefer. So all that kind of pieces are components of the digital front door as well. We're also allowing easier access into our providers more of a, um, a roadmap of how to get to the appropriate level of service, whether it is a e-visit or a virtual visit or a clinic visit or an ED visit, all those different pieces, we're building those in again to make it a lot more precise and a lot more personalized with our relationships. Right, and I think you alluded to a very important aspect of it, which is ensuring that uh, caregivers and providers are appropriately enabled when you talk about digital programs. And, and that's actually a great segue to the next topic that I was gonna explore with you. We've seen in the last several months, ever since the pandemic hit uh, early in the year, there's been a dramatic shift towards telehealth modalities and that was essentially forced upon us by the pandemic. But it's also going down a little bit as uh, patients start coming back into in the hospitals. So do you have a viewpoint on where we are headed really with regards to a long-term shift towards telehealth and virtual care models in general? Yeah, I think from a general perspective, the movement toward these virtual encounters or relationships will, will certainly continue to accelerate as well as get a lot more difficult in the types of interactions that we could have. It's starting today and more or less with very staple commodity kinds of services, you know, what I would term probably level one, level two, and we're starting to see some shift, I believe, within the emergency departments where some of that care was actually more appropriate and more cost effective in a lower cost setting. And some of those are actually moving into virtual, for example, or into a clinic visit versus coming in through the emergency departments. As we continue to mature that and get more, part of our job is to get more tools into the hands of our patients or into the hands of our consumers. 
I think we'll continue to see that kind of shift. I do like to analyze it back to things that are happening in other industries. I like to be able to learn from other industries, apply them toward healthcare. I think the reverse is probably true on their behalf, but similar to how we see kind of retail working our way through where you kind of had a, you know, kind of a, uh, a large disruptor coming into the market. Not everybody who was not into the online type of service moves into the online service. And I think we'll see that here. I think we'll see a, a continued progression of how we can advance our services and the access to those services by using uh, telehealth or virtual care. I do think that, you know, for me, that brings up one point. So when I refer to other industries, I don't refer to them as a, I have a virtual encounter with my banker or my financial investor or a virtual encounter, you know, with a store. I call it online. It is really the same level of service that I'm getting, but at a more cost-effective and convenient manner. So I think as a industry, when we start shifting our mindset from telehealth or virtual care into that it's just online care or online health. It's just a way that we access other services and other parts of our life. I think that will be a, a big mental shift for ourselves as well as our consumers and patients to continue to evolve and advance those services. It's interesting you mentioned other industries. Uh, you mentioned retail, you mentioned personal banking. I just published an article talking about how healthcare is beginning to borrow from the best practices of these other sectors, which are much further ahead in terms of their digital engagement with their consumers. In fact, a lot of healthcare is already online and with the rise in uh, the need for contactless and low contact experiences, it's almost going to feel like a drive-through experience in some ways. If you don't have to come into a facility, if you don't have to come in contact with anyone, you just don't. You, you come in for exactly what you need and you move on. It's an interesting new dynamic that I imagine has developed purely as a result of the pandemic, because a few months ago, who would have thought that going to meet your doctor would be a high-risk experience? But yeah, here we are. So let's talk a little bit about the tech, Craig. You already mentioned several technology partnerships. You mentioned Salesforce and Google and some of the others. But when you come to technology choices and implementing digital programs, specifically, let's say, digital front door programs, how do you go about making your technology choices? And what do you see as the role of uh, core transaction systems, enterprise IT, such as your EHR system? How do you do the trade-offs and how do you really go about making your choices? Yeah, so a couple of things. It's, I think it's a, it's a great, uh, it might be a little bit of a, a complex kind of a, a question, but let me try to see if I can break it down. So one, in, in terms of our, technology choices that we're implementing, it's really big for me to have uh, trusting relationships, utilizing the network that we've built up over a period of time in our careers, and really start to look to see that we're focusing upon people who are more in a partnership perspective and not necessarily a vendor. And things that uh, for me that are important are being very agile, being able to pivot quickly, so those kinds of companies are really, for me, uh, very important to how we want to progress and move forward with. We can be at times be a very large vessel for people to steer, but I need people to help me really kind of turn that vessel at the right time and at the right speed, and hopefully be able to then serve the customers in a way that's unique and different from my competitors, at least for a period of time until they catch up with that work. So the partnerships and how we assess who we work with is, uh, is an important piece for me. As part of that, we actually have five major partners that we do work with. One is that we mentioned was Salesforce. Another one is Google, big partners of ours. We also have Epic, which is a big partner. Oracle is a big partner. And ServiceNow is a big partner. So those are the five major companies that we deal with. Then we have a lot of peripheral companies that kind of evolve around that. But I think that's part of our job as a partner as well, is to be able to educate and help them be a lot more nimble in certain areas of their work where they're also learning and want to deliver better services back out to uh, their customers. On the enterprise IT side, that's not gonna go away. That will be with us. And part of our job is to make sure, how do we leverage the data and the assets and the workflows that are built within those large systems, whether it's the EHR system, or whether it's an ERP system or your workforce or office productivity systems, how do you get your new digital pieces to be part of that? One component is to make 
sure that you try to work with your partners to help them so that it is integrated and fully integrated in the workflow. And that may be something that may take a couple of years. So in the meantime, you may have to work with some smaller, more agile companies that are newer into the industry or in your services. And in some cases, they become a bridge strategy that for a period of time, could be two years or three years, until your major partner can actually catch up, you've got to maybe jump out and fill in some gaps that way. Or in some cases, they may develop to be a long-term partner moving forward and you help expand their relationships. The advancements that are happening with these investments, as you know, Patty, are quite large and we're moving toward what would be more of a, um, you know, annual or sometimes every two years types of large upgrades or movements. And because of the cloud services, the software as a service concept, what we've all learned to adjust, you know, with our smartphones, you know, updates come very frequently and sometimes a couple of times a day, if not a couple of times a week. Those things will continue. And so for us to move from annual events to that would be called upgrades to things that are updates, continuing to keep ourselves very current with what those investments are coming out to be, and at the same time, get some of our newer digital assets integrated. And the only way to do that is to have a large, a large number of frequent smaller updates versus large upgrades. Yeah, and I imagine that the technology firms who are going to be listening to your comments are going to take careful note of what you just said. It seems to me that you're looking at the marketplace in a way that gives you the, the option to swap out technology providers if you need to, especially the ones that are young and maybe innovative today, but they need to scale up. And if they don't scale up or if one of your strategic partners comes up with a solution that is superior and is and integrates better with your with your internal ecosystem, that may be the direction you go. So that obviously raises some very interesting questions and some implications, both for your internal organization as, as well as for the startups. So does this mean now that you're going to be entering an era where it's going to be plug and play, easy to replace, and uh, that's going to be the order of the day? Is that what's going to happen in the next two or three years? I think, you know, if you look at it to some other aspects of our life, let's just easily just take kind of a uh, an automobile, for example. There's components of the automobile that really work well together. And in some cases, those different components in and of themselves may not be the actual best in class for that piece. But when you look at the whole workflow together, it actually is what I want to go ahead and, and be able to utilize. So, for example, uh, GPS. So when GPS first came out, it was very, um, very nice, easy to use, but also very dated. Some of the maps you would get in your GPS yeah. were a couple of years old. So many of us bought like a garment, a stick on, you know, something to put on your windshield yeah. to have to get more current. It wasn't as large. It wasn't integrated. When somebody called on the telephone, it didn't tone down. That speaker still worked. So it was a piece that we put in there for a bridge. And then what we started seeing is in the digital aspect, the smartphones and Google Maps, et cetera, a lot more currency happening on your phone. So what they did, they took a lot of the infrastructure that was built for your maps that were built into your GPS system that you paid a lot of money for. And then now they take the agility of what was built within your smartphone, and now you're connecting the two together. Yeah. So you're using the features from Google or Apple. Now the things that are most current and are right on my phone, I can now bring that kind of guidance and that kind of intellect into my GPS. So I no longer have this little one-off sitting off to the side to help me navigate better. I've actually taken now something more modern, but still rather small and personalized and something more what I would call industrial strength, both into the car. And now I've linked them together and put those, put that in place. And I like to use GPS as an example too, of just kind of like artificial intelligence, right? So uh, many of us have no in our mind where we want to go from point A to point B. But because of weather, traffic, other types of considerations that will happen throughout the day, it will reroute you and take you to the most efficient way. And that's a simple way for me to explain when people say, what is artificial intelligence? Well, just think about your GPS. Or another way for me is to think about what happens when you listen to music and they offer up to you or Netflix. They offer up to you other programming that is similar to what they're learning from what you listen to or watched you in the past. All that we already have within our personal life, we don't even think twice about it in many cases. 
So as we start to build that kind of knowledge and that intellectual capital into the workflow of our professional life, I think the outcomes are going to be tremendous. Yeah, I love the analogy of the uh, GPS and how different generations of GPS devices and applications, how many different generations we've seen in a relatively short time, and even in the context of the car. That's, that's a fantastic example. But you mentioned AI, so let's talk a little bit about emerging tech. What excites you today about the emerging technologies out there? What kinds of technologies do you think are going to make a difference in the way healthcare is accessed and delivered in future? Well, yeah, there's a few that we are certainly uh, very engaged with and probably others that will be coming down the road that I can't even think of. But at the moment, there are several ones that I would highlight. One is voice. I do yeah. think the voice is going to continue to be a great user interface. We use it today at home, you know, with our Amazon or Alexa or our Google Home to be able to use our voice, to be able to interface with other network systems, for example, whether it's your your shades or your uh, climate control within your home. Those, that's all could be happening through voice. I do think the digital workforce is a big piece to keep an eye on. And that really is kind of taking a lot of the lower commodity type services and automating those and allowing to free up those human resources to do more advanced type of work. So I think that whole piece will come into play. When you look at AI, you know, we're just scratching the surface of what AI is. And I think some people have a, uh, well, certainly we all have some, some probably different versions of what that is. But there was a saying that was said to me a couple of years ago, and I really, it really stuck with me. And I think the evidence so far really uh, supports that, that artificial intelligence, you know, which is really intelligence, but it won't replace providers. But providers without artificial intelligence will be replaced. So yeah. I think it just goes out down to say artificial intelligence by itself, not going to be the top outcome. Providers by themselves, the humans by ourselves, no, nope, not going to be the top. But if I can overlay and put both of those together, so I got the best of both worlds, the results of an outcome of something AI may be filtering through, or after a provider does some work, AI comes on top and does more of a peer check via automation, all that kind of stuff, I think we'll end up with a, a higher outcome on the back end. I do have a big belief that I'm not a big fan of customization as many people know, but I am a big fan of personalization. And I think as we get more precise with our medicine, so things for Patty of what's in your DNA and your genetic makeup might be different than mine. And so those kinds of ways that we treat you, even though we have the same disease type, the other determinants, whether they're social determinants or genetic determinants will actually maybe have a different way of how I'm being treated. And I also think the same is for nutrition. So I think things of how we do to stay healthy and well, that may be different for you than me, is how we get more science around some of this art. So it's a lot more specific, a lot more precise, and also a lot more personalized. Yeah. So Craig, you and I, we live in the world of technology. We get excited by all this stuff. I believe too that voice is going to be huge in future. So AI, voice and automation, RPA, we've talked about all chatbots, we've talked about all of that. What about the end user? What does it take to really make sure that they are just as enthusiastic in adopting technology solutions in their access to care or in delivering care, whether it's a patient or whether it's a caregiver? How do you make sure that all this technology really helps them do their jobs better? We hear a lot about what the EHR systems did over the last 10 years, and I don't want to go there, but I'm just curious to know your thoughts on this. Yeah, I think for me, you know, if you look at the healthcare ecosystem, similar to some of the other analogies we did in the past with other industries, the patient is probably the most underutilized resource. He or she, given the right tools, will make a lot of the great decisions as opposed to a provider at a more expensive rate, be able to make those decisions. And we see that in other things with whether retail or financial services, et cetera. A lot of that stuff, given the right tools to use, he or she wants to be engaged, wants to be involved, not necessarily want to be an order taker. They really want to be engaged and they want to be part of the conversation. I think it's our responsibility to give them the right tools to allow them to become a lot more engaged access to their own data to allow them to be a lot more informed about what data is being used. Because when you look at it, you know, when you get right down to it within a healthcare provider, we're really, our product is really data. 
we produce data, a tremendous amount of data, and then we inform people, make decisions based upon the data that we produce. We don't produce a, a car or a vehicle. We don't produce a, a widget, but we actually produce data. And then all of our decisions that is driven through how we best utilize that data. And the more access we have to the data, the better decisions that we'll be able to make. And I think when it goes to going back to maybe some of our uh, resources on the provider side or on the system support side, those that are associates, very similar. You know, part of our job is to get people to really look at their contributions and how much they're actually delivering to the service. So if I can take away some tasks or automate or provide better decision support that will have better outcomes at the end, that's my responsibility to help make their jobs easier, more effective, and more efficient. When startups who are listening to this podcast want to know or come and ask me, how do I get to be a part of Craig's digital journey? What is your response to them? Well, it's very interesting. There's a, um, you know, that's probably still a lot more of an art than a science for sure. There are a lot of forums out there now. Actually, I think a lot of our virtual stuff has increased the amount that we can attend and be part of. Whether somebody like myself, who might be a purchaser or a partner of those services, sitting on a panel, a part of a certain association, I think their engagement and support of what that is, ask good questions, provide good answers and insights that maybe will get us to start thinking a little bit differently. It only takes one little piece of something to catch somebody's eye to get that kind of gleam where it's like, I want to learn more about them. But we also quickly, because of the volume coming in and the time constraints, we quickly say no to. And in yeah. some cases, we may, not, we may say no to something that would say, oh, darn. But it is a very competitive landscape. And there's a lot of people offering similar types of services. So you got to somehow be able to show me how you are unique, distinct, how you can help provide something quick for us. These are not like, quote unquote, long-term investments. I need a quick contribution, a quick return for these kinds of things, which may mean that you have to offer something that in a long-term business model may not be great at all, but to get yourself there, to get a positive client, a great case study. I think there's there's several of us, certainly in the industry, that are very acceptance to that kind of, quote unquote, low calculated risk with the potential for huge returns. So just kind of continue to pursue. Don't be a pest, but you got to be persistent. Oh, that's great. That's a great quote. And I'm certainly going to use that. <laughs> well, we're coming up to the end of our time here, Craig. And uh, I want to ask you one last question. You've already accomplished quite a lot within a short time, I can tell, at SEO as Chief Information Officer and Chief Digital Officer. So you now have a unique perspective on the digital transformation journeys as seen from the point of view of a health system executive if you had one best practice that you would like to share with your peers in the industry, what would it be? Well, I will share two. <laughs> so will, Go right ahead. Go I'll, right ahead. I'll take the bonus. <laughs> so the first one for me is that these aren't projects. These are programs. Projects have begin dates and end dates. And your programs really continue to evolve and mature. And you'll have many projects that are part of these programs. So this is not something that if you reach a certain point, there's success. When you reach at a certain point, that's just the launching pad for taking what the next point is. So the digital piece for me is a journey and it'll continue to evolve and mature. And the more that you can accelerate and have uh, proper governance, uh, very measurable outcomes, because some people can get lost in the actual work itself and you know, we don't get rewarded on best efforts. We get re rewarded on our contributions, the outcomes that we influence. And that leads me to the second one, which is really, some people say, what's your digital strategy? And I'm like, I don't have one. That's the same answer I had 20 years ago when they said, what's your, you know, your IT strategy? I don't have one. There's one strategy. The strategy is that of your company, your system. So I have a strategic plan that was approved by our board, developed by our senior team, it has imperatives and initiatives. And what I am is I am actually an accelerator and a contributor to helping to move that work forward and achieve some of those results. So I am just a tool to help our strategy, but in and of itself, I, I am not a digital strategy and I don't have a digital strategy. I am here to support the healthcare system strategy that 
has been put together. And I think that's a clear distinction that you are not the end game. Again, tying back to the first note, you're here to support the patients, support the providers, and support your communities. And part of all that, it comes into you contributing to the company strategy, but you're in and of itself are not the strategy. Oh, that's so beautifully said. Well, I guess we're going to have to leave it there for today, Craig. Thank you so much for setting aside the time to talk to us. And uh, I look forward to staying in touch. Thank you once again. Thank you, Patty. I appreciate the conversation and uh, looking forward to our future as well. We hope you enjoyed this podcast. We invite you to subscribe to our weekly newsletter, The Healthcare Digital Transformation Leader. Write to us at info at with your feedback and questions. 